Hello and welcome. I'm James Woodburn, publisher of Jim Rickard's Strategic Intelligence here in Australia. Today I'm joined by the man himself, straight from his self-sufficient mountain farm in New England, as well as our Australian investment director, Nick, Nick Hubble, zooming in from his bulb hole in London. Now, I, I requested this call because the crisis we are seeing is something that Jim has not only called years in advance, but it's also something he and Nick have been helping prepare readers for and position their wealth for for a long time now. So right now, the, the vast majority of the world is under lockdown, both physical and economic. Stock markets remain open as of today, Thursday, 2nd of April, although that could possibly change at any moment, uh, and we'll talk about the outcome. The health pandemic that sparked all of this was really the ele element of surprise, but the freeze on huge parts of the world's economy is actually something Jim warned about back in 2016 in his book, The Road to Ruin. So I thought, Jim, uh, let's start with you. Is this, is this the first stage of Ice Nine, do you think? Uh, it, it could be. We're certainly dangerously uh, close, and we'll, we'll have to watch it carefully. But just for the benefit of the uh, viewers, maybe I'll just take a, just a minute and explain what ICE-9 is. Um, it, it's an idea that I nicked from uh, um, Kurt Vonnegut, who uh, wrote a novel in the 1960s called Cat's Cradle, which I highly recommend. A little bit of uh, dark, uh, uh, we call it a dark humor, dark comedy. But uh, in Cat's Cradle, the, there was a physicist who created an isotope of water called ice nine and had the following properties um it was frozen at room temperature but if you if a molecule of ice nine came in contact with a molecule of water the water turned to ice and you had a small vial and if you poured it into a stream let's say the stream would turn to ice but then through contact so would um uh you know the rivers and then the oceans and then all the water on earth and then life on earth would die. So it was a doomsday machine. Of course, this was written at the, during the, the height of the cold war when we were all worried about nuclear war. Um, so what I did, I took that concept and brought it over to capital markets. And I made the point that you can close a particular venue if you have disorderly trading. So let's say um, the stock market's crashing, the circuit breakers don't work, and they decide to close the stock market. Well, they can do that, but it doesn't alleviate the demand for liquidity. People will simply go over to the money market and say, well, fine, I'm redeeming my money market funds. So then you have to shut the money market funds. And then it goes over to the banking system and people queue up at the banks and just try to take all the money out of the banks. And then you have to shut the banks and so forth. In other words, there's a kind of financial contagion um, to go along with our, our viral contagion that we're, we're facing now, uh, where every time you close something, the pressure goes to another venue and then it has to be closed. And eventually you end up shutting down all the markets, banks, stock exchanges, et cetera, in the world, at least temporarily until you come up with some kind of solution. Um, so that was the idea. Um, it's interesting to see that ICE-9 has now become part of, uh, I would say, standard financial jargon. I, I see it all the time. Uh, you know, they don't credit me, let alone uh, Kurt Vonnegut, who, who came up with it. But that's okay. It's it's uh, uh, it's it's useful. It's more than a metaphor. Actually, the math is the same, and it has become uh, parlance. So, uh, my book, The Road to Ruin, um, from 2016, uh, described this uh, uh, um, phenomenon. My my latest book, Aftermath, came out last year, but this book, The Road to Ruin, interestingly, the uh, you know, like any author, I check the Amazon rankings every now and then. The Road to Ruin is selling uh, even faster than some of my other books, even though it's a few years old, because it does have this explanation of Ice Nine, which we just talked about. Um, and then people say, well, that will never happen. And I, I remind them, uh, no, the, uh, the New York Stock Exchange was closed for five months from uh, August 2000, uh, sorry, August 1914 to December 1914 at the beginning of World War I. In 1933, our President Franklin Roosevelt closed all the banks in the United States by executive order, all of them. Uh, he didn't say when they would reopen. In fact, they reopened about eight days later, but no one knew that at the time. Uh, they used the euphemism, the banking holiday. Well, it wasn't a holiday. It was, they were closed by orders. Um, in 2013, all the banks in Cyprus were closed. In 2015, all the banks in Greece were closed. People in Athens were flying to Frankfurt with empty suitcases, filling them up with euro, physical paper euro notes, and flying back to Athens because the banks were closed, the ATMs were shut down, the credit cards didn't work, et cetera. Um, 
And so all these things have happened before. Uh, they happen under duress, under stress. But the idea that uh, you know th that would never happen is not true. And then all I've done is take that a step further and say, yeah, and it can be worse than that because they can be kind of closed down sequentially, at least until um, monetary authorities come up with a solution. So we're, we're seeing the very early stages of that. We've seen a couple of trading halts on the New York Stock Exchange. That's not the same as shutting the exchange, but we hit these circuit breakers. The floor of the stock exchange is closed. Now, I think most people know that 95% or more of the trading is, is robotic. Uh, so, you know, the computers are doing fine, but the floor of the New York Stock Exchange right now is closed. Um, I went to a bank the other day, it was closed. Now there were other offices elsewhere. I can do online banking, but the banks are closed, not by uh, um, government order, but just because of the virus. So, so we're seeing it happen in certain ways. And uh, I think people uh, who assume it can happen take too much for granted. Well, you mentioned the 1930s there, and that, that was really like a, a, a proper shutdown from the highest level. So maybe I'll bring Nick here. And do you think we're we're seeing something similar? Is this essentially is, is this a bear market, or do you see a, a greater depression at play? And maybe Jim can expand on that as well after. Yeah, I'm going to steal Jim's metaphor. Really, we're all looking up at the sky, wondering which snowflake is going to trigger the avalanche. We should all be looking at the snowpack. Um, you know looking at where the avalanche is going to happen, regardless of, of what the snowflake is that triggers it. And there's so many different things that could go wrong right now. Jim profiles them every month, every week. Um, we've been you know, laying them out in front of readers for so long now. But what coronavirus has done is trigger all of them at the same time. They're all in play. Um, all of the things that we've written about, that we've researched and looked into over the years, they could all go wrong. And you know, chances are some of them will go wrong. And so in the end, you, know, you need to be looking at where the real threats are uh, other than coronavirus, and you need to be focusing on what the financial threats are. Would you agree with that, Jim? Yeah, I do. And uh, just to take it a step further, this, this is not, well, I'll, I'll speak specifically about the United States and Europe, but I, uh, a good reason to believe similar things are happening in Australia. This is not a recession. This is a depression. So you, the, the two, you can look at 2008, uh, you can look at 2000 in the US when we had the dot-com crash, you can look at 1998 with the uh, long-term capital management in Russia, you can look at 1994 with the tequila crisis in Mexico. None of those uh, financial panics or drawdowns really uh, are the proper baseline for understanding what's going on now. You have to go back to 1929, you have to go back to the depression and uh, the Great Depression. And I remind people that in the Great Depression, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, our main stock market uh, index, fell 89%, not 30% or 40% or 50%, but almost 90%. It was exactly 89.2%. That's what a that's what a depression looks like. That's what a real bear market looks like. So, our stocks are down thirty percent. Okay, that's that's a lot. That's a lot of lost wealth. It's a shock to most people. I've heard of people getting their. Uh, we have the uh, these four hundred one k plans, tax deferred savings plans, like a little personal superannuation fund, um, and people are getting their monthly statements in the mail and they're just putting them in the trash. They're they're afraid to look at them. Um, but that's pretty bad. But but that's nothing compared to what happened in nineteen twenty nine. So down. 30%. Okay, that's bad enough. But imagine down 40%, 50%, 60% or more. That's what we're looking at potentially. This is uh, one of the questions I'm asked most frequently lately is, um, you know, is the bottom in? Is this a safe time to, you know, kind of go back in the water and 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 buy stocks? And my my answer is absolutely not. I mean, yeah, you'll have a couple of good days or little three day rallies here and there, but but the bottom's not in. This is just the first wave of repricing by the stock market with much more to go. Well, you mentioned the, the bringing it back to, to to Australia. I mean, that the stock market here is down forty percent from the peak in in, in late February, uh, but also. Uh, Another record that Australia holds is that we've got the highest or the largest household debt in the world. Mm -hmm. And the lion's share of that debt is held by the banks. So what happens, perhaps that, that's a question, what happens when the financial freeze potentially hits the banking sector? Well, well, the first thing that happens, of course, is people just can't pay. I mean, you want to pay, you want to stay current, but if you have a large uh, debt, particularly in credit cards or um, you know some uh, auto loans or some other uh, asset category or borrowing ca category, well, if you if you've lost your job. 
uh, you just simply can't pay it. Or even if you maybe still have a job, you're, you're trying to increase savings or pay down other debts, et cetera. So then at that point, the loss falls on the bank. And so the consumer is kind of, you know, the, the, that damage is done, but now the loss falls in the bank. And the question is how solvent are the banks? Now, okay, the, um, the Reserve Bank of Australia can print money and, and bail out the banks if they choose to, although that's a pretty unpopular option. That happened in 2008. Australia was not as badly affected in 2008 uh, as, as say the United States or, or Europe or some other areas. Um, Canada also held up fairly well, but they may not be uh, uh, quite so lucky this time. Well, if you start bailing out banks, you're talking about political ramifications, social unrest, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, if you have to nationalize the banks, let's say, and uh, wipe out equity, give the debt holders a haircut, uh, you know, re-IPO them perhaps, uh, these, are, these are major, major uh, disruptions and uh, could result in banks being closed for some period of time. So it doesn't it doesn't have to be a sort of full on ICE nine, although it could be on a global basis. But uh, you can have major disruptions even in a, a single country if their banking system is under that kind of stress. Nick, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, yeah. your perspective based in London. Yeah, so there's a reason why banks need central banks and deposit insurance to back them up. It's because they can fail catastrophically. They can implode. And you know, from the Australian perspective, that did happen in 2008. It just happened in a secret way. So the Australian banks were some of the first to request bailouts from the Federal Reserve, and they did that through their branches in the US. Um, and you know, they may be doing that now because it wasn't discovered until a long time later. It was actually an American piece of legislation that forced the Fed to publish who had requested the bailouts, the backdoor bailouts. And it turned out that the Australian banks were at the top of the list, two of them in, in particular. So this is a very real threat. It did happen not so long ago, and the conditions this time around are worse. Right. And just to add to that, um, Woody, the, uh, you, you know, when you look at uh, the kind of banking system collapse, well, just in, in the United States, our Federal Reserve um, has already, uh, j just now in the early days of this crisis, uh, they bailed out the uh, so-called primary dealers, so the ones who make a market in government securities. They bailed out the commercial paper market. They bailed out the corporate bond market. They bailed out the municipal bond market uh, and so forth, set up term asset uh, lending facilities. They're now in the process um, of basically bailing out the world through these uh, uh, swaps that we just talked about with other, with a long list, a longer list of central uh, foreign central banks. Um, so, uh, so the Fed's bailing out everything. Uh, and by the way, don't call this stimulus. This is not stimulus. This is not going to get the economy going. They're just keeping the lights on. They're doing what they have to do. I'm not criticizing anybody except I could go back, uh, you know, 12 years and show you how we got here. But um, uh, you have to do this. But all they're really doing is keeping the lights on. They're keeping liquidity flowing. They're keeping the the plumbing from uh, getting backed up, if you will, in the global financial system. But that's all. I mean, so may, maybe they've stopped the bleeding from a liquidity point of view, at least temporarily. But that's not stimulus. That's not going to get the economy moving. That's not going to get, that's not going to restore confidence. So this is, uh, you know, when I was a, a Boy Scout around 10 years old, I learned how to fix and apply a tourniquet to someone who's bleeding to death. Well, okay, tourniquet will, might stop you from bleeding to death, but it's not going to get you back on your feet anytime soon. Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, it's, the the reports lately of these stim well I say stimulus in quote marks because as you say they're not really stimulus packages but um, Australia three hundred and thirty plus billion I mean that's across the federal government the RBA and the individual states that's what they pledged to fight this thing um, obviously that's a drop in the ocean compared to the US I mean you're talking multi trillions I mean but, what what what's going to be the outcome then? If, the, if these measures aren't going to work, what what are they going to lead to? Well, they uh, what they are is a temporary fix to uh, mitigate some of the worst damage in the short run, but they are not going to lead to growth. And and by the way, you know when you say multi trillions, uh, just to put that in perspective, our Congress passed a law just a few days ago uh, setting up a two point two trillion dollar. Uh, rescue fund. So this is, uh, you know, 50 billion for the airlines and um, 100 billion for hospitals and 
350 billion for small business loans, et cetera, an enormous amount of money. Um, but, but buried in that 2.2 trillion was 425 billion for the treasury to recapitalize the federal reserve. Now I've said for a long time, you know, the fed, as I just mentioned, they, you know, they guaranteed commercial paper, corporate loans, um, uh, primary dealers, uh, you know, municipal bonds, corporate bonds, et cetera, they're guaranteeing all these markets, but who's guaranteeing the Fed? Who's bailing out the Fed? Well, we just found out it's going to be the United States Treasury. Um, and so they're putting $425 billion in, in new capital into the Fed. So think of that as a Fed bailout. But of course, the Fed is uh, operates like a bank. So they're going to leverage that 10 to 1. So they're going to take the $425 billion in new capital and turn that into $4.25 trillion of money printing. So you have to at, take that $4.25 uh, trillion, add it to the $2.2 trillion from the Congress, you're really looking at closer to $7 trillion of uh, direct loans because the, because the reason the Fed is going to leverage the balance sheet is because they're going to buy loans. So you're looking at a $7 trillion injection. The, the Fed balance sheet is already past $5 trillion. Now, bearing in mind, after the 2008 financial crisis from 2008 to 2014, the Fed balance sheet peaked around four and a half trillion. They're already past five trillion. They're on their way to seven or eight trillion dollars, uh, more than doubled where this whole thing started. Uh, you know, is there some limit? Well, there's there's no legal limit uh, actually, but there could be a psychological limit. There could come a time when people just wake up and say, "Hey, I don't know what's going on, but this is, this is ridiculous. I, get me out of the dollar. You know, get me into you know gold or land or." Uh, natural resources, anything, but, but get me out of the dollar. We, we, uh, we may find out the hard way that that point exists. Um, we, Nick and I were talking just yesterday in preparation for this conversation. And we, as, as you're talking about the U S packages that have been agreed in uh, over there, what does this do? Let's bring in Trump a little bit while we're on that topic, Nick. I mean, what, what does that do for, for Trump's chances? Do you think, I mean, that, that, that's what the latest monthly issue in, in strategic intelligence covered, right? Yeah, so it's a really strange situation because you've got the government, you know, forcing the economy sort of into lockdown, and then that necessitates a government bailout. So the two together, you know, only make sense with each other. But the problem is, all of this is going to lead to political backlash because it is, in effect, a bailout, and bailouts are not you know, politically popular and, and feasible in an election year. So the question becomes. You know, with the election cycle coming up in the US and the US economy and the US financial markets dominating everything, what will happen between presumably Joe Biden and Donald Trump? And Jim, you've recently covered this in the monthly issue, so why don't you take it away? Um, sure, and you know, I don't do uh, I don't do politics as a lead subject. I I, uh, I kind of keep out of it as much as I can. Say, hey, vote for whomever you want. That's not my job to, you know, promote one candidate or the other. But the linkages between politics and economics are so dense. It's so densely connected at the states that you have to talk about politics if you want to understand economics and and ultimately capital markets. So. Um, that's right. I mean, I have a, a model that uh, based on predictive analytics, that's proprietary that I use to forecast U.S. election results. And of course, in, famously in 2016, when Hillary Clinton was given a 92 percent chance of winning, I actually was on uh, nationwide television in Australia with uh, our friend uh, uh, Tiki Forward, and, and she asked me who was going to win. And I said, uh, Donald Trump. I said, it'll, it'll be close. We'll be up late, which was true. But Donald Trump would win. And I said that on other uh, broadcasts as well. So uh, until about six weeks ago, that same model, which of course I update, showed Trump with a 74% probability of winning. But there was an expectation that that would move, get you know closer to 90% by election day. Well, that's out the window because the, the key variable, the key explanatory factor was no recession. Uh, so if the odds of a recession were less than 20%, then Trump's odds of victory were upwards of, of 80%, or in my case, 74%, because one was just the inverse of the other. Well, now the recession's here. In fact, a depression is here. Uh, that doesn't mean Trump's odds go to zero, but, you, but what you do with this method, you reset it it at 50 50 make it a toss-up and then you update as new information comes in trump's not uh, trump's not being blamed for the virus he's not being blamed for the pandemic he will be judged on his response function not that he caused it but how he handles it that's how he's being judged and you know a few blunders here and there that's always the case but on the whole he's doing a good job and the american people see that but my point is 
if you're 50 50 that means there's a it's kind of a toss-up as to whether joe biden becomes president that's new now the market is working very hard to the stock market is working very hard to discount the effect of the coronavirus that's difficult because no one knows quite how bad it would be also discount the effect of the new depression of the economic drawdown uh that's even more difficult because we haven't seen anything like this in, in within living memory um and it's also a moving target it keeps getting worse the one thing the market has not tried to discount but will very shortly, and this is another headwind, is the prospect of a President Biden, because Biden's platform is higher taxes, more regulation, and the Green New Deal. Well, that if, if you just had that to worry about, that would cause stocks to decline uh, on top of all the other bigger problems we already have. So um, there's just, um, that's why what's one of the reasons, not the only one, I see stocks are far from the bottom. They will come down a lot more um, because they haven't even begun to factor in the prospect of uh, President Biden. Well, Jim, so, so <clears throat> that, that sort of leads nicely into my next question, really. Uh, in your books, uh, we pride ourselves at strategic intelligence for trying to uh, anticipate events and be two steps ahead of everyone and that's kind of what you've been doing over the last decade with your books i mean currency wars came out while globalization was still really the idea of the day the death of money came out when qe was fueling the new bull market really the big drop described exactly the experience uh, the the crash that we're experiencing now the new case for gold was published before gold really truly established established its bull run the road to ruin described how governments would react to the next crisis. And now we have your new book, Aftermath. So in the spirit of trying to stay two steps ahead for, for your readers and your subscribers, are we on track for the money reset anytime soon? And what does the world look like after that? Right. Uh, you know, and you're right. What in, the irony of writing these books is they were all intended as warning, not just warnings, they were certainly intended as warnings, but they were also intended to help people get ready for what was coming. I mean, I, you know, I was recommending gold at $1,100 an ounce, then 1200 1300 1400 1500 and everyone yawned and didn't buy it. All, now all of a sudden it's 1600 everyone wants it, but you can't get it. I mean, the, the mints are back ordered, the refiners in Switzerland are closed, uh, some of the logistical operations, you can't get physical gold. Uh, at least I, Perth Mint as well? Uh, I'm not sure of the status of the Perth Mint, but I, I believe they are back ordered. I know the US Mint is back ordered for the rest of the year. So they're still producing gold coins, but they're all spoken for you. If you have a new order, they won't return your call. So, um, so it, it's, you know, when people would say, well, you know, Jim, why don't you, you know, if you wouldn't mind, call me the day before the crisis hits and I'll uh, sell my stocks and buy some gold. And my answer was, uh, first of all, I won't know the exact day. I'll tell you what's going to happen in the order of magnitude. I won't know the exact day. Uh, if I did, I might be a little busy myself. But, um, but the, real, the real point is, what are you waiting for? When the crisis comes, it's already too late. The market has gapped down. The gold's not available. The time to get it is when things were still relatively calm. Uh, but um, but it's not too late. Uh, you you know because this is gold is going to go much higher and stocks are going to go much lower. And even though we've had some of that adjustment, it's not by any means done. So yeah, leaning forward a little bit and seeing what's what's going to come next. Um, unfortunately. Uh, these complex systems have a way of crashing into each other. Uh, my example is always March 2011, the Fukushima disaster in, Ch in Japan. You had an earthquake that turned into a tsunami, that turned into a nuclear meltdown at a power plant, that turned into a stock market crash. So you had four separate systems, you know, seismology, hydrology, radi radioactivity, and capital markets, normally independent. <laughs> of each other, but one complex system crashed into the other. We're seeing something like that right now. So pandemic, just epidemiology by itself is a complex dynamic system. It has now crashed into the economy and we're, we're in a new depression. That has crashed into the political arena, which uh, we just talked about with Nick, with uh, the prospect of a President Biden. But it'll go further. And, and unfortunately, the next uh, problem I see is, is actually social unrest, uh, that this the economic 
Um, the, you know, the unfairness of what happened in 2008, that memory is still fresh. Every day people suffered. Um, you know, the big banks and the elites were bailed out. Jamie Dimon still got his bonus, even if you or your next door neighbor were unemployed for years. Um, so that, that uh, anger is still there. Now comes another wave, even worse. Um, and as we start to see something similar where, you know, the rich are fine, but everyone else is suffering, you may see demonstrations. You may see uh, riots. Um, let's see what happens this summer at the, at the conventions of the political parties. Uh, hopefully nothing uh, in the streets, but you, you can't rule that out. So I do see um, some kind of social unrest uh, coming in. But again, these are reasons to have some... Uh, some physical gold, for example, because uh, one of the things I like about physical bullion, it's not digital. You know, you can't hack it. You can't freeze it. Uh, you can't, uh, um, you know, block it the way you can with other digital assets. You know, there, there are a lot of Americans now racing down to the bank trying to get some cash. They want some physical cash, you know, in case the power grid goes out or, you know, electricity goes out, you, you get, the gas pumps don't work, you know, et cetera. ATMs don't work. Um, what they're finding is they can't get their money. You know, you walk up uh, to a tower and say like $10,000 in cash, you know, nice uh, $100 notes or whatever. Um, they'll tell you to come back, you know, make an appointment, come back next week. Or I can't give you all that much because, you um, uh, you know, we've got other customers asking the same thing. So uh, I like to say, you know, people say they have money in the bank. I say, well, once you put your money in the bank, it's not your money anymore. It's the bank's money. And they'll give it to you if they feel like it. So that comes as a, as a rude awakening to a lot of people. So all of this could be pointing towards um, social unrest on top of the economic crisis that we're already in. And I guess the way to just round that off is that, you know, the, the, the last time this big, big seismic change happened, we had the Bretton Woods, really, didn't we? Um, is there a parallel to back then? I mean, that, that, that was really seen as a, um, a, a way of uh, the elite to try and uh, regulate the system with, and create some cohesion and stability in the system. Would you say that the next reset will be more about control? Uh, yes. And um, yeah, the reset is coming. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow or, or next month. Uh, the, the first line of defense, uh, although I think it won't do much good, uh, is coming from the central banks and, and fiscal policy and monetary policy. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to see four trillion U.S. dollars of money printing from the Fed. And we're going to see two or three trillion dollars of additional deficit spending. That's on top. We were on track for a trillion dollar deficit in fiscal 2020 anyway. Now put 2.2 trillion on top of that. And the Congress is already talking about another bailout bill, perhaps a uh, trillion dollars or more. So may, we might have $5 trillion of deficit spending, $5 trillion of money printing. Uh, but but all that combined uh, won't work. And so six months from now or a year from now, we'll still be in a, an economic funk, at which point, uh, if there's still this demand for liquidity, is still a, a US dollar shortage, you may see the IMF step in because they have a relatively clean balance sheet. You know, the Fed is uh, well, it was so badly leveraged, as I say, they had to recapitalize it with $425 billion. But, uh, and by the way, other central banks are no better off. If you look at the ECB or the... People's Bank of China, the Bank of Japan, they're, they're even worse than the Federal Reserve, uh, believe it or not. So, um, so when that's at its limit, when that's run its course, the only entity left in the world with a clean balance sheet that can print money is the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. They can print a form of world money called the, the SDR or the Special Drawing Right. It's a geeky name, but it's geeky on purpose because they don't really want people to understand what it is. But what it is is world money from a world printing press. Um, and that can come. But to do that, you're going to need the approval of the executive committee. And China, Russia, and a few other BRICS and Venezuela and other, um, you know, kind of rogue nations or, or adversaries of the United States collectively can block that from happening unless their conditions are met. And one of the conditions could be, okay, fine, we'll approve the printing of the SDRs, but you have to agree that the SDR is the new benchmark global reserve currency. It doesn't mean the dollar disappears. You'll, you'll you know, if you can't fly to the United States, you'll still need dollars. If I go to Mexico, I need Mexican pesos, so the dollar will be a local currency. But important things like the 
price of oil, uh, earnings of you know the 100 or so largest global corporations, settlement of balance of payments, uh, uh, differences or balances, denomination of reserve positions. These will all be settled and stated in SDRs in this world money. And that will be the price of uh, getting the printing presses rolling at the IMF. So that's a, that's a monetary reset even more significant in this way than uh, the, the Bretton Woods standard. Now, will it work? Different question, I, I'm, I'm doubtful, but I, I believe it will be tried. Uh, and to be tried, you're gonna have to run the dollar off the road to get, to, uh, to get the printing presses going on the SDR. Well, I guess that brings us to, um... <laughs> how you prepare and what you can do. Now, Now, Nick, the portfolio of investment solutions that you select and oversee for Jim's advisory here in Australia has been holding up pretty well um, through this crisis. Obviously, no guarantees anything will continue, uh, of course, but you've also authored the special Australian chapter of Aftermath aimed specifically for Jim's Aussie readers. So um, what are you telling readers, readers specifically to do with their money in the midst of all this? Yeah, now that COVID-19 is you know, the dominant news story, um, just as social distancing is the solution to, to the virus, I see that financial distancing is the solution um, to, to what's happening in financial markets. So basically what I think subscribers should be doing now is moving their money into investments that are not directly connected to the financial system. Now, that doesn't mean sell everything and, and run for the hills. That means have some of your, your wealth exposed to non-financial assets, assets that don't rely on a counterparty to pay out on claims. So when you invest in the stock market, you rely on the company's management to do that. Bit. You rely on the stock market to be open. You rely on your stockbroker to do what you're telling them to do. Um, and there are investments that you know, provide decent return which don't require all of those counterparties that you, know, you can hold the investment in your hand. Um, so there's no one that you need to rely on for that investment to perform um, you know, in the way that you intend. So a lot of the, the recommendations that I see is coming alive right now. Um, and you know, obviously people should have bought them already, but for the newer subscribers, the things that they should be focusing on are non-financial assets like the ones that we detail in that bonus chapter of Aftermath. That's great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, and I think that's probably a good place to end. Um, we, we've gone on for 30 minutes now, and so that's a good time to end. So thank you both for making the, the time to have this conversation. It really is appreciated. As I said, Jim, you've been anticipating this crisis for many years, and now it is actually playing out. And I know you're in very high demand, but you're always very gracious with your time and your knowledge. And I think all of uh, your readers and all of our strategic intelligence subscribers will really appreciate uh, the thought that you put into your comments and, and, and to you, Nick, too. So thank you both and uh, stay safe. Right. Thanks. Hi, James Woodburn here, publisher of Jim Ricker's Strategic Intelligence here in Australia. As you've seen, Jim's been one step ahead of mainstream analysts through the entire COVID-19 crisis. He predicted it would be a global catastrophe in early February, well before markets caught the fever. So what does Jim see happening next? Well, as he just told his US publisher, Pete Coyne, complete monetary system shutdown. At the end of such a scenario, the entire global financial system shuts down and any Federal Reserve intervention may no longer be effective. It's worth pointing out that this is a scenario Jim has highlighted for several years as the bookend of this historic bull market. The difference now is it appears to be in motion. So what can you do to shelter your wealth here in Australia? Jim and his team suggest a variety of possible protection measures, and they've outlined them in a brand new financial pandemic shelter report now available to every Australian concerned about where we're headed. Simply click the link below this video and you can get access right now.